Peter took a seat around the campfire. It was good to rest. He's been Jesus' disciple for about two years now. It was, it was good to take a break from the crowds. But to be fair, being Jesus' disciple had a lot of perks, especially when it first started out. Jesus called him, he threw out his net, and he caught hundreds of fish all at once. Jesus healed his mother-in-law from a deadly fever. He even invited him to a wedding, and when they ran out of wine to drink, he turned the barrels full of water into wine just by snapping his fingers. It was fun. Enjoyable. But recently, not so much. It's become more and more challenging. The other religious leaders, be it jealousy, be it pride, were getting angrier and angrier. They heckled him as he spoke, heckled them as they walked. In fact, it even got a bit violent. Recently, one of Jesus' ministry partners, John the Baptist, had been killed, head cut off. And there were rumors already that they were hoping to do the same thing to Jesus. It's good to take a break and reflect. And as Peter chowed down on a little bit of fried fish from the fire, he thought about everything that had happened. Is it really worth it? Is Jesus really going to do something awesome? Uh, was he really building something amazing here? And did he, Peter, really want to be a part of it? Good time for Peter to reflect and also apparently at the same time Jesus. As the disciples chatted quietly amongst themselves, spoon hitting the bulls they were eating from, Jesus speaks. Hey, guys, what do you think? Who do the people that we've been talking to, who do they think that I am? Look around. And they all speak at once. You want to answer Jesus' question. Oh, well, some of them say that maybe you're John the Baptist. You know, that famous prophet dead came back to life. Or maybe you're Elijah. Some say Jeremiah, another one of the prophets, some prophet, we don't know how to pronounce his name, Malachi, Zephaniah, someone. Uh, to be honest, Jesus, they got a lot of different ideas. Some say you're a nice guy, some say you're a scoundrel. Some say you speak the truth, some say you're nothing but a liar. Some say you're from God, some say you're from the devil. Jesus took it in. And look directly at Peter. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter's eyes immediately avert Jesus's, uh, trying to get away from the intensity of the conversation, looks around, other disciples uh, shaking their heads, shrugging, not sure what to say. And Peter thinks, he remembers about how the crowds are angry and upset and how they don't like it, but he also remembers what he's seen, how he made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, the sick to be well, the dead to rise. And reflecting on those truths, Peter looks up, clenches his fists and speaks confidently. You are the Christ the Son of the living God. It's quiet. Did you hear that? God? But Jesus doesn't respond by face palming. He doesn't slap him upside the head. He doesn't even say close, but no cigar. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For you have had this revealed to you by God. You didn't come up with it on your own. 
In fact, uh, you are Peter, which means you're a rock. And on that rock of a confession that you just made, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, yes. Today's a special day. Today we're taking a look at groundbreaking, starting the new early childhood centers, our expansion that's going on, a building right across the way. We want to take a look at Peter's confession because it's going to teach us some really important truths that we need to remember as we go about the business of building this uh, new center. Before we do that, let's say a prayer and ask God to bless us. Oh Lord, strengthen us this morning by the truth. Your word is the truth. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear and open our hearts to believe this precious truth you would have us believe. Amen. It's a pretty interesting section because it gives for you a glimpse into the mind of the very people who actually talked with Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who saw Jesus do things, who probably gave Jesus a high five if high fives were around back then. It gets you an exact idea of what they thought of Jesus. And the answers, you saw them from Matthew 16, the answers the disciples say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. A prophet, by the way, is someone who speaks God's word. God tells them, they share that message, whether it's a direct voice from God or a dream or whatever, they're bringing the message from God. If you're a prophet, special, right? That's different. That's not normal. But it's a little bit more than that. Did you notice John the Baptist, well, actually, prior to this, he had died about maybe six months earlier. Uh, Elijah, he's even deader, been deader for longer. Jeremiah, one of the prophets, same thing. What's pretty interesting here is that they see Jesus special in two ways, right? You're a prophet. Oh, you're a prophet, come back to life. It'd be, for instance, if you guys, I asked you who I thought you thought I was, and you said you're Elvis Presley. Okay, that'd be pretty cool. That'd be impressive because he's an impressive guy, first of all. Second of all, impressive because he's dead, huh? That would be pretty impressive to come back. I disappointed some people there, yeah. (laughs) The king lives. Understand this. The people at that time, they saw Jesus as something important. They saw him as something special. They saw him as something extraordinary. They had a high opinion of him. It just wasn't quite high enough. I've completely lost my thing. I got the camera up here. You guys want to smell for a picture? Yeah. Hold on for a second. I'll keep talking if you wouldn't mind just fixing this real quick. Um, <laughs> another reminder, another reminder that God is in control. Not, not me. This isn't good. Um, Yeah, so some say John the Baptist, others Elijah. The point is they they had a high opinion of Jesus. When you get and you're able to switch to the very next slide, take a look at this. Mr. Rogers, do you guys know who Mr. Rogers is? Yes? Say yes. Good. Does anybody hate Mr. Rogers? I, I don't think so. Nobody does. Everybody likes Mr. Rogers. He's a nice guy. What does he do? He teaches you that it's okay to wear a cardigan sweater. He teaches you about the land of make-believe. I remember the other those videos where he visits factories, teaches you how crayons are made. Just about everyone likes Mr. Rogers. My point is he is not a divisive figure in any way, shape, or form. Nice guy. We like him. Sometimes I wonder if we don't view Jesus the same way. Well, nice guy. You know, most people will say that, even if you're a believer, non-believer, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, whatever. Uh, Jesus is nice. Maybe not Christians necessarily, but Jesus, he, he's good. I like him. I think that's pretty interesting. But question, what's the problem if the premise of us building that preschool is in the name of some guy who's just kind of like Mr. Rogers? In the name of some nice guy in the name of someone who's kind of sort of good. Well, then it becomes nothing more than maybe George Washington University, named after a president who was an okay guy, I guess. Or John Hopkins University, named after a guy who had a lot of money, bought a hospital. Or named after William Bucknell University. I don't even know who that is, but it sounds pretty important. So 
Jesus is more than Mr. Rogers. If he's just a nice guy, well then what is much of a difference between that building that we'll build and anywhere else? You can get good ed- education in a lot of other preschools. I don't mean to advertise for other preschools. You can get good education there. You can find loving people, the people who are kind there. You can find good arts and crafts programs. They'll, they'll help you make all kinds of different coloring sheets for your kids. What's the difference? Because we're not building this just on some nice guy. Take a look at what Peter said. Do you remember? Peter said this. Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Two things about Jesus. Number one, he calls him the Christ. That's pretty interesting. Christ is a Greek word. It means the anointed one. Makes you think of that literary trope, right? The chosen one. You can see that all throughout literature, whether it's Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, the one chosen to bring balance to the force, or whether it's Neo bringing balance to the Matrix, or whether it's Harry Potter uh, defeating him who was, must not be named. Very similar and yet a lot different because Jesus and his message, this promise of the chosen one, had taken place long before any of those books ever came into existence. In fact, about, oh, 4,000 years before Jesus even was around, prophecies predicting his coming happened. Pretty amazing. Old Testament prophecies that said he would be born in Bethlehem. Old Testament prophecies that said he would grow up in Nazareth. Old Testament prophecies that said the Messiah would be Jewish. Old Testament prophecies that said he would be born of the tribe of Judah. Old Testament prophecies that said he would die on a cross. Old Testament prophecies that said on the cross he'd ask for vinegar. Old Testament prophecies that said his bones would not break. Old Testament prophecies that said he'd be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace would be on him. Old Testament prophecies that taught on three days later he would come back to life. And these visual prophecies, these visible prophecies in the Old Testament, they help us to understand that the invisible prophecies are fulfilled too. Old Testament prophecies that said he would come to defeat our sin. Old Testament prophecies that said he would come to win forgiveness. Old Testament prophecies that said he would come to bring eternal life. Old Testament prophecies that said he would bring peace between us and our Heavenly Father. The point. Jesus as the Messiah means this building takes on an entirely different meaning. We're not just building on some nice guy. We're building on much more than that. We're building on the one long promise to save us. We're building on the one long promise to save our community, the one long promise to save our kids. But it's more. Highlight the next phrase. You are the Son of God. (coughs) About a year and a half ago, my sister was with child and gave birth to my niece, Harper Grace is her name. She lives up in Wisconsin. So that's a little bit far, far away. I didn't get to see her right away. Saw text messages, saw videos, saw photos, Facebook Live. But about, oh, maybe about seven or eight months ago, finally got a chance to see her in person, and I can now confirm she is, in fact, real. She is, in fact, a human being. It's simple. It's kind of silly, right? But, yeah, of course. From humans come humans. From humans come humans. From dogs come dogs. From cats from come cats. From African pygmy hippopotamuses come African pygmy hippopotamuses. And from God, God. It's a little bit deeper when you get into the realm of God, of course. And if you ever want to drink some coffee and talk about some deep theology with me, from God, God, and yet God, of course, being God, always there. God from God from eternity. And yet here's the point, and here's what Peter was saying. Jesus is God.
He's got a lot of godness to him. He's divine. That's a huge deal. And notice, by the way, Jesus does not say stop. And this is a big moment, okay? Because if we've been thinking up to this point, well, Jesus is just kind of a good teacher, as soon as he calls himself God, he now rules that out. Why? Well, if you're a nice guy or you're a good teacher and you call yourself God and you're not God and you tell people you're God and you're not God, you are immediately a terrible teacher, correct? And if you're a nice guy and you tell everyone that you're God and you're leading them away from the true God, you are immediately not a nice guy. It comes down to two options now, right? Good teacher's not one of them. He's either no good or he is who he says he is. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. God. And if you're Peter and you're looking for proof, suddenly you remember how he touched a man's eyes and helped him see for the very first time. How he touched a man's ears and helped him hear for the first time. How he reached down and helped a man who had never walked a day in his life to walk for the rest of his life. How he walked on water himself. How he reached up, said stop, and the stormy weather was done. How he turned that water into wine just by telling them to go get it. How he helped Jairus' daughter who was dead in the bed to come back to life. How he called out to Lazarus in his tomb come out you are alive how he was killed and three days later came back to life himself he did the thing that only God can do while he was dead which usually when they're dead people can't do much he did the impossible it means this we're not just building the memory of some human no we're building on the living God we're building on the almighty Father of heaven and earth. We are building in the true God. We are building on the God who has always been there and who will always be there and who is with us right now and with our kids. Which means, for a second, quick, it kind of transforms that building there, okay? More than just a preschool. And I want you for a minute, when you go out there later on today and you check out that whole area that we're going to be building, just to visualize for a second. Visualize. Juliana's real good at this. She can see plenty of things. I'm like, it's a wall. I don't know. Um, visualize for a moment the preschool when it's all done, and you're going to see a nice big old doors. You're going to see plenty of classrooms, uh, hopefully state-of-the-art type stuff. You're going to see furniture. You're going to see toys. It's going to look pretty good. And you'll be able to see the final product, and the final product will be a church. Y'all are like, wait a second, did you like get the plans wrong? I'm pretty sure we were doing a preschool. Before you go talk to the construction manager and set me straight, wait for a second. Here's what Jesus said to Peter. Do you remember this? He said, on this confession, the confession that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. You know, this is one of the first times church, the word church, appears in Scripture, ecclesia, right there. I don't picture this big old church building. They didn't have church building like we got right here, huh? It's an assembly, a group, the people focused in. And what's the group tied together? Well, it's a group tied together in Jesus. In other words, for Jesus, church is not a building. It's not some kind of religious organization. It's a group of people. Forgiven, loved, a community in Christ. Which means God has been building his church, if you will, ever since he started talking to those disciples. And he was building his church when he made you a part of it. Baptism, Lord's Supper, God's Word. And it means that God will be building his church in that building over there. Every time a teacher has him sit down, crisscross applesauce for story time, Bible story time, God is building his church. Every time the toddlers sing, Jesus loves me, God is building his church. Every time a parent goes through the Bible story with their kids at home, God is building his church. 
Every time one parent talks to another and one explains the hope they have in their Savior, God is building his church. Every time the director has to deal with a little kid who's maybe has gotten a little bit out of control, uh, maybe hit a friend and knocked over some toys, and they come in and she tells them that's wrong, and they start to get teary-eyed, and they blurt out, I'm sorry, and instead of saying to them, it's okay, or no big deal, or you better not do it again, she simply says, that's why Jesus died. It means God forgives you. It means I forgive you. And God is building his church. Suddenly, this is a bit intimidating, isn't it? We're doing more than just building a place to learn ABCs and one, two, threes and do art projects and baking soda volcanoes. It's more than just helping kids get ready for life. It's getting ready for eternal life. Ooh, that's a weight on your shoulder. But what did Jesus say next? He said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Notice who is doing the building. It's Jesus himself. We ain't in this alone. Jesus says, I'm going to do it. And you know what? He's pretty good at doing it. The things he built last, his body died, he came back to life, defeating sin and death. He's going to be with us too, guys. We aren't alone. The Lord and our Savior is with us. He's with you as you're building the church in your own families. The Lord, your Savior, is with you. And then he says what? The gates of hell will not overcome it. Because the honest truth is, there's going to be times when we get a little bit nervous, a little bit frightened, a little bit scared. Uh, we're counting pennies. Uh, is it going to match up? Uh, we're trying to figure out, well, did we choose the right color for it or not? Uh, we get a little bit nervous, maybe even in a disagreement, it's going to fall apart. Oh, no. Of course, the devil's going to do everything possible to try to stop it, right? Because he knows what happens at the end of that building. You're going to teach about Jesus. God built his church. He wants to stop it. The gates of Hades, hell, will not overcome it. Because when God sets his minds to it, it's as good as done. And even if, God forbid, even if something happens and that never gets completed, God still builds his church. And he will. So the what now for this week? One simple word. Build, right? <laughs> what now build? God's building with us. God is with us. And you might say, well, I don't know. I don't got a lot of construction knowledge. I don't know if I'm going to be able to build. Well, if you can't saw a saw, pray. If you can't hammer a hammer, share the message of your Savior if you don't know the difference between the Phillips screwdriver and the flathead screwdriver, help share God's word. Keep building. Uh, you're all important to this. Working together as the church of God to help grow this church of God through God, our Savior, who is in control and who's working this for you and me. Today we're praying God's blessings on this building project. May he be with us now and into the future. Amen. Let's say a prayer and ask God to bless us. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us this day, for the blessings of these kids, for the blessings of being able to share your message. Help us to share that message both now and always. Be with us throughout the building project. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll continue by responding to him, singing the next song of praise. It's called Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. <laughs>